Biology 101 Lecture 11. Hello, students. Today we're going to study Mendel's work. This is the coolest stuff ever. So we're going to talk about inheritance, and we're going to talk about all the stuff that Mendel's did, and genes and alleles and all these good old things. So these are pretty old ideas. Mendel was, started his theory of inheritance in 1865. Um, he was a monk, and he uh, was just very interested. He was pretty learned. Um, he, one of his his uh, teachers was uh, Doppler, so he he had some really good training. Um, he himself didn't really believe his his results um, because he wasn't really sure of uh, what he was doing. He was very meticulous and kept really good records, but um, his work was largely unaccepted and uh, sort of kind of forgotten for quite some time, for 50 years. Uh, and, and then it was uh, rediscovered. So uh, his theory wasn't actually accepted until 1915. But uh, his inheritance laws enable prediction of expression of traits on the basis of mathematical probabilities. That's the beauty of the whole thing. But first, we have to have some definitions. So we start out with saying, what is a heritable feature? Um, a heritable feature, as defined by Mendel, is something that varies among individuals, such as flower color. He was looking at a lot of flower color. And he called that a, a character. Each variant for that character, mm -hmm. such as you know a purple or a white color for the flowers, is called a trait. So those were Mendel's words. Um, for each biological trait, an organism inherits two alleles, one from each parent. This is what we know now. He didn't know that. He sort of suspected it, but he wasn't. Um, there was no technology at that time for him to confirm his suspicions. Um, and then the allele is defined as an alternate version of the same gene. The alleles can be identical or they can be different. If both alleles for the gene are identical, the organism is said to be homozygous for that gene. If the alleles for that gene are different, the organism is said to be heterozygous for that gene. And we get on to go on to the law of segregation, Mendel's law of segregation. In this law, what he says is allele pairs separate randomly or segregate from each other during the production of gametes or at meiosis. So a sperm or an egg carries only one allele for each inherited trait. And that is true. When the sperm and egg united fertilization, each contributes its allele, and thus it restores the paired condition in the offspring. And that is the law of segregation. There is another law of Mendel, and that is called the law of independent assortment. Mendel also found that each pair of alleles segregates independently of other pairs of alleles during gametogenesis. And that is called the law of independent assortment. This law applies only to genes on different non-homologous chromosomes or those far apart on the same chromosome. Genes located near each other on the same chromosome tend to be inherited together as in a block. Uh, more definitions. Genotype, phenotype, what does it mean? The genotype of an individual is made up of the alleles it possesses. The physical appearance, called the phenotype, is determined by its alleles as well as by its environment. The presence of an allele does not mean that the trait will be expressed in the individual that possesses it. Homozygous and heterozygous. What are their definitions? So we should make it perfectly clear right, right about now. An organism with two identical alleles for a character is homozygous for the gene controlling that character. An organism that has two different alleles for a gene is heterozygous for the gene controlling that character. Unlike homozygotes, heterozygotes are not true breeding. So when we look at this particular image, um, what we see are Mendel's flowers, the pea flowers that he was looking at, and the phenotype is the color, which is purple um, or white. And then uh, what we see on the right-hand side 
um, uh, are the genotype, which is not uh, apparent. The phenotype is what is apparent. So there are three purple flowers for every one white flower um, in the offspring. However, uh, the uh, ratio, the phenotypic ratio is three to one, whereas the genotypic ratio is not that. It's actually one is to two is to one. So there's one homozygous dominant, one homozygous recessive, and two heterozygous um, genes, gene pairs. In the law of dominance, if the two alleles of an inherited pair differ, that is to say they're heterozygous, one of them will determine the appearance of the organism. And it is called the dominant allele. The other has no noticeable effect on the appearance and is called the recessive allele. This is known as the law of dominance. Conventionally, uppercase letters are used to represent dominant alleles and lowercase letters are used to represent recessive alleles. Mendel did a bunch of experiments. Um, we're just going to look at just a little bit of that. Mendel bred two contrasting true breeding varieties of pea plants, and that is known as hybridization. The true breeding parents were called the capital P generation. The hybrid offspring, offspring of the P generation were called the F1 generation. When the F1 individuals self-pollinated or were cross-pollinated with other F1 hybrids, an F2 generation was produced. And that is what we see over here. So um, at the very top of the picture, what you see is the parental generation, which is labeled P. So what Mendel did was he actually went around and, um, and he had a lot of time. So he snipped off um, stamens or uh, ovaries of every single plant so they couldn't self-fertilize. And he only wanted certain things to fertilize certain things. So he went and he used paintbrushes to take the pollen from um, what he wanted and put it in the flower that he wanted to see the result. Um, and so when the fruit was formed, which are the peas, um, they were then um, put in the ground, they germinated, and the first filial generation uh, was looked at. And that is at the very bottom of the picture, which is labeled number five. The law of segregation. When Mendel crossed contrasting true breeding white and purple flowered pea plants, all of the F1 hybrids were purple. But when Mendel crossed the F1 hybrids, many of the F2 purple plants had purple flowers, but some had white. So Mendel discovered a ratio of about three is to one purple to white flowers in the F2 generation. And he, he counted hundreds and hundreds of plants and he did this repeatedly. He was very, very good at keeping records and he kept meticulous records on this. So here we are. Uh, this is the P generation. He crossed a purple and a white flower. And he got the F1 generation, which is a hybrid, but every single plant uh, had purple flowers. There were no white flowers. And then uh, the F2 generation, he uh, uh, pollinated them together, the F1s with other F1s. And he ended up with the same stuff that he had from the parent, which is purple and white, but in a different proportion in a th three to one proportions. He reasoned that the only the purple flower factor was affecting the flower color in the F1 generation hybrid. Mendel called the purple flower color a dominant trait and the white flower color a recessive trait. And we still use those terms today. The factor for white flowers was not diluted or destroyed because it reappeared in the F2 generation. So he concluded it was just hidden. Mendel also observed the same pattern of inheritance in six other pea plant characters, each represented by two traits. So he didn't just do flower color, he went and repeated this idea in many other traits. So what Mendel called a heritable factor is now what we call a gene. Um, these are all the traits that he looked at. Uh, he looked at purple and white flower color. He looked at seed color, yellow or green. He looked at seed shape, round or wrinkled. He looked at pod shape, inflated or constricted. He looked at pod color, green or yellow. 
and he looked at the position of the flower. Was it axial or was it terminal? And he looked at the stem length. Was it really tall or was it a dwarf? And in every single one, he repeated this experiment, and in every single one, he got a 3 to 1 ratio uh, for the F2 generation, which was just simply amazing. So he started to think about that. Um, if you just look at one gene, you will get the 3 to 1 ratio uh, by crossing it in the F2 generation. That is known as a monohybrid cross because we're just looking at one gene. But in nature, you don't just inherit one gene. You inherit many genes at the same time. Um, however, uh, the ratio for phenotypes is 3 to 1 uh, for a phenotypic cross, phenotypic monohybrid cross. And these were all borne out with his experiments. And he developed a hypothesis to explain why is it 3 to 1 inheritance pattern. He had four related concepts make up this model. And these concepts il illustrate now uh, what we know about genes and chromosomes. And he didn't even know about them at that time, but he had a hunch. The first concept was about alleles. Alternate Alternative versions of genes account for variations in inherited characters. For example, the gene for flower color in pea plants exists in two versions, one for purple flowers and the other for white flowers. These alternative versions of the gene are called alleles. Each gene resides at a specific locus on a specific chromosome. And we know that today because we um, have gone all the way down to the DNA and we look at it and uh, we found where is this locus for the purple flowers and where is the locus for the white flowers. The second concept, for each character or trait, an organism inherits two alleles, one from each parent. Mendel didn't know about chromosomes at that time, but it fits perfectly with the pr proof found later. The two alleles at a particular locus may be identical as in the true breeding plants of Mendel's P generation, or the two alleles at a locus may differ, as in the F1 hybrids. Third concept. If the two alleles at a locus differ, then one, the dominant allele, determines the appearance, and the other, the recessive allele, has no noticeable effect on appearance. In the flower color example, the F1 plants had purple flowers because the allele for that trait is dominant. And the fourth concept, which is also known as the law of segregation, was that two alleles for a heritable character separate or segregate during gamete formation and end up in different gametes. Thus, an egg or a sperm gets only one of the two alleles that are present in the organism. This segregation of alleles corresponds to the distribution of homologous chromosomes to different gametes in meiosis, as we know today. Um, we also uh, can uh, prove this by using Punnett squares. Possible combinations of sperm and egg can be shown using a Punnett square. A Punnett square is a visual representation of Mendelian inheritance. Punnett squares give probabilities only for genotypes, not for phenotypes. Okay, and here we are. Um, we're going to uh, show you the P generation, which we already did, the F1 generation, which we already did, and then at the bottom uh, in the F2 generation, we're actually making a Punnett square. And so if you notice, um, the capital P is for uh, dominant purple flowers, and the small p is for recessive white flowers, um, which are in the parents, and then you have the hybrid F1 generation, which has dominant capital P and recessive small p. So it has both versions of the same gene uh, existing in that individual. When that individual is uh, crossed, um, you get the 3 to 1 ratio, and um, the phenotype will sh be indeed three purples to one white, but the, the genotype will actually be um, shown by crossing the first plant will have um, both dominant homozygous alleles, um, and diagonally opposite it would be the uh, plant with the recessive.
homozygous alleles. And then uh, on the cross diagonal, you'll see the heterozygous plants. Um, they're both purple, but the, the alleles are not uh, the same. They're heterozygous. In a dihybrid cross, we could do this. Um, we, we really should be crossing much more than two genes at a time because obviously uh, the offspring does not differ from its parent in just one or two characteristics. But this will show you how complex it suddenly becomes when we, you're just taking into account two, two genes. Um, the ratio then becomes 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. And that is typical for a dihybrid cross. And we'll look at a Punnett square that has 16 blocks to it. Crossing true, two true breeding parents differing in two characters produces dihybrids in the F1 generation, heterozygous, of course, for both characters. And we can take a look at it right here. And so if you see the parent um, is, um, has a nice, big, smooth, round, yellow um, seed, and it is dominant and homozygous for yellow and for uh, roundness. And the other parent is um, recessive and homozygous, and it's green and it's wrinkled. So uh, when those gametes pair up in the F1 generation, you get a heterozygous individual with uh, both traits, but both of them are um, heterozygous. And it, phenotypically, it appears like one of the parents, which is yellow and smooth. So um, since he could predict that if I had one um, gene crossing, I would end up with a Punnett square uh, with a phenotypic ratio of 3 is to 1. Um, when you have 2, then you just expand it, and you end up with the phenotypic ratio of 9 is to 3 is to 3 is to 1. And that is exactly what he saw when he counted up everything. So if you look at it really closely, this is what you see. Uh, notice the very first topmost square on the top diagonal, dominant homozygous for both alleles and both genes. And in the very bottom corner on the right, um, it's homozygous and recessive for both um, alleles and genes. And in between, you have every uh, variation possible. So um, Mendel's laws of segregation and independent assortment actually reflect, reflect the rules of probability. When you toss a coin, the outcome of one toss has no impact on the outcome of the next toss. It doesn't know what the previous toss was, if it was heads or tails, and it doesn't care. And it just, um, the outcome comes whatever uh, it, it does, and that's just probability. In the same way, the alleles of one gene segregate into gametes independently of uh, each other's genes' alleles. So the multiplication rule states that the probability that two or more independent events will occur together is the product of their individual probabilities. Segregation in a heterozygous plant is like flipping a coin. Each gamete has half a chance of carrying the dominant allele and half a chance of carrying the recessive allele. So as you see in this picture, there's a coin flip and um, it, each allele here um, has half a chance of being dominant and recessive in this um, Punnett square. The addition rule states that the probability that any one of two events will occur is calculated by adding together their individual probabilities. So this can be used to figure out the probability that an F2 plant from a monohybrid cross will be heterozygous rather than homozygous. If we extend Mendelian genetics, we come to these ideas uh, of inheritance of characters by a single gene. Um, which can deviate from simple Mendelian patterns. So we'll just extend those ideas of Mendel's 
and um, see that when geals are not completely dominant or recessive, what happens? When a, gel has, a gene has more than two alleles, what happens? And when a gene produces multiple phenotypes, what happens? So those won't be classical Mendel um, patterns because he didn't study those, but we know these now, um, that things weren't as simple as they seemed. There are degrees of dominance. Complete dominance occurs when phenotypes of the heterozygote and the dominant homozygote are identical. In incomplete dominance, the phenotypes of the F1 hybrid is somewhere between the phenotypes of the two parental varieties. In codominance, two dominant alleles affect the phenotype in separate, distinguishable ways. And so here we have uh, two other different plants. Um, one parent is, has red flowers, the other parent has white flowers. And when you have the first hybrid generation, it is not red, it is not white, it's pink. So that's an example of incomplete dominance. And um, you actually see the genotype and the phenotype being the same um, in the F2 generation. One is to two is to one instead of three is to one. Tay-Sachs disease, for instance, um, is, is fatal. It's a dysfunctional enzyme. Um, it causes an accumulation of lipids in the brain. Um, and it's a really interesting uh, uh, disease to look at because at the organismal level, the allele is recessive. At the biochemical level, the phenotype is incompletely dominant. Mm -hmm. But at the molecular level, the alleles are codominant. So this is a very interesting case. Most genes exist in populations in more than two allelic forms. The four phenotypes, are, for instance, of the ABO blood group in humans are determined by three alleles for the enzyme that attack enzyme. Um, this enzyme is just capital I. It attaches A or B carbohydrates to red blood cells. And so we would uh, write it out as capital A, uh, superscript capital, I'm sorry, capital I, superscript capital A, capital I, superscript capital B, and then um, lowercase i because it doesn't have either. The enzyme encoded by the capital I, superscript capital A allele adds the A carbohydrate, whereas the enzyme encoded by the capital I, superscript capital B allele adds the B carbohydrate. And the enzyme encoded by the lowercase i allele adds neither. So um, here we see that uh, depicted in, in a table format, which is nice and easy to see. So um, you can see that um, the red blood cell, you can have the blood group A or B or AB or AB is a heterozygote, or you could have the recessive form which is, oh, it has neither. Pleiotropy. Most genes have multiple phenotypic effects, a property called pleiotropy. Pleiotropic alleles are responsible for the multiple symptoms of certain hereditary diseases, such as cystic fibrosis and sickle cell disease. In epistasis, a gene at one locus alters the phenotypic expression of a gene at a second locus. For example, for Labrador retrievers, coat color depends on two genes. One gene determines the pigment color with alleles capital B for black and small b, lowercase b for brown. The other gene with alleles E, capital E for color and lowercase e for no color, determines whether or not pigment will be deposited in the hair. And here we have an extended Punnett square with the two, uh, it's a dihybrid cross. And what you see is um, uh, the appearance of the dogs. Um, it's different. And this is called epistasis. So this is um, not the classical Mendelian inheritance, but um, a different form of it. Polygenic inheritance. Sometimes traits vary in a continuum, like skin color or height. So it won't be complete, um, incomplete dominance. It, it'll just be a continuum because we'll have a slightly different shade or a slightly different height, and there's no one set number. 
This is known as polygenic inheritance, an additive effect of two or more genes on a single phenotype. And um, here is uh, the Punnett square for that. And there are three different genes. And you can see how complicated it suddenly becomes. And you have to add up all these numbers. So uh, we don't really um, do that that much because it's not really possible to go um, much beyond two or three. Um, but sometimes the phenotype for a character depends on the en environment as well as its genotype. Traits that depend on multiple genes combined with the environmental in influences are called multifactorial. Diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, alcoholism, mental illnesses, and cancer have both genetic and environmental components. So the picture gets even more muddied um, as we start to factor in more and more um, uh, effects. Recessively inherited disorders show up only in individuals homozygous for that allele. Carriers would be heterozygous individuals who carry the recessive allele but are phenotypically normal. Most individuals with recessive disorders are born to carrier parents. For example, albinism is a recessive condition um, characterized by the lack of pig pigment in skin and hair. Okay. Um, here is uh, the sickle cell allele, and you see what happens. Um, here is a relationship of, here's, it's just a summary. Summary of complete dominance, incomplete dominance, codominance, multiple alleles, and ple pleiotropy. And then we go on to epistasis and polygenic inheritance. And so um, this is just summarizing what we just went over. Um, here is another summary slide. This is the chromosomal basis of Mendel's laws. And you should see meiosis occurring and what happens in uh, metaphase and anaphase in both of these um, uh, in, in, uh, to show Mendel's laws. You see the law of segregation happening at, met happening at metaphase 1 and the law of independent assortment happen happening at metaphase 1. Where is the proof of Mendel's ideas? Well, it's everywhere. Morgan showed that genes are carried on chromosomes and are the me mechanical basis of hereditary. He used fruit flies, uh, Drosophila melanogaster, to study genetics. Um, he didn't use peas. Um, he, the reason he chose fruit flies is because they produce many offspring. Uh, a new generation can be bred every two weeks, so it's kind of quick. You get an answer really fast. And they have only four pairs of chromosomes, so not a lot to mess around with. Um, in one experiment, Morgan mated male flies with white eyes, which was a mutant, with female flies with red eyes, which is the wild type. So the F1 generation all had red eyes. The F2 generation showed the 3 to 1 ratio of red to white eye, um, like expected, but only the males had white eyes. And that was important because he determined that white-eyed mutant allele must be located on the X chromosome. So then we found sex-linked genes. In humans and other mammals, there are two varieties of sex chromosomes, the larger X chromosome and a smaller Y chromosome. A person with two X chromosomes develops as a female, while a male develops from a zygote with one X and one Y. Only the ends of the Y chromosome have regions that are homologous with corresponding regions of the X chromosome. Short segments at the end of the Y chromosome are homologous with the X, allowing the two to behave like homologs during meiosis in males. A gene on the Y chromosome called SRY, or sex determining region on the Y, is responsible for de the development of testes in an embryo. A gene that is located on either sex chromosome is called a sex-linked gene. Genes on the Y chromosome are called Y-linked genes. There are a few of these because the Y chromosome is very small. Genes on the X chromosome are called X-linked genes. X-linked inheritance. X-linked genes follow specific patterns of inheritance. For a recessive X-linked trait to be expressed, a female needs two copies of the allele, so she has to be homozygous, but a male only needs one copy of the allele, so he's hemizygous because he doesn't have the entire chromosome. 
X-linked recessive disorders are much more common in males than in females, as you could see. A double dose of the X chromosome in the female does not result in double doses of active genes. The second X chromosome just simply shrivels up into a bar body and becomes inactive. So um, in reality, the Y chromosome being small doesn't really affect either gender because the X chromosome in the females also shrivels up um, into that size. So uh, it's about even. Some disorders caused by recessive alleles on the X chromosome in humans are color, color blindness, which is mostly X-linked, and uh, it's usually just expressed in males. Um, Duchenne mus muscular dystrophy and hemophilia, also in males. How linkage affects inheritance. Genes located on the same chromosome that tend to be inherited together are called linked genes. They're inherited as a block. Morgan did other experiments with fruit flies to see how linkage affects inheritance of two characters. He noticed that some genes do not assort independently. So here was a violation of Mendel's law, and he reasoned that they must be on the same chromosome. Offspring with a phenotype matching one of the parental phenotypes are called parental types. Offspring with non-parental phenotypes, which means a new combinations of traits, are called recombinant types or recombinants. A 50% frequency of recombination is observed for any two genes on different chromosomes. And as we can see in uh, this um, planet square. Morgan also discovered that genes can be linked but the linkage was incomplete because some recombinant phenotypes were observed. He reasoned that some process must occasionally break the physical connection between genes on the same chromosome. That mechanism was the crossing over of homologous chromosomes. Recombinant chromosomes bring alleles together in, a new, in new combinations in gametes. Random fertilization increases even further the number of variant combinations that can be produced. This abundance of genetic variation is the raw material upon which natural selection works. Um, one of Morgan's students, Sturdivant, constructed a genetic map, which was an ordered list of the genetic loci along a particular chromosome. The farther apart two genes are, the higher the probability that a crossover will occur between them, and therefore the higher the, the, higher the recombination frequency. They are not real distances, uh, like you know measuring with a ruler. It's just an order. Um, and he actually created a linkage map. A linkage map is a genetic map of chromosome-based um, on recombination frequencies. Distances between genes can be expressed as map units. One map unit, or centimorgan, represents a 1% recombination frequency. Map units indicate relative distance and order, not precise locations of genes. Genes that are far apart on the same chromosome can have a recombination frequency of almost 50%. Such genes are physically linked, but genetically unlinked and behave as if found on different chromosomes. So Mendel was actually lucky. So here is a, um, a genetic linkage map, and it actually shows you the chromosome and where those characteristics reside. Um, sometimes we have an abnormal chromosome number. In non-disjunction, pairs of homologous chromosomes do not separate normally during meiosis. As a result, one gamete receives two of the same chromosome, and another gamete receives no copy at all. So this is an example of non-disjunction. And as you can see um, in the very bottom row where you have uh, the gametes, um, something is amiss because they should have two in every um, cell, but no. So two cells have three, and two cells have one. Aneuploidy results from the fertilization of gametes in which non-disjunction has occurred. Offspring with this condition have an abnormal number of a particular chromosome. 
A monosomic zygote has only one copy of a particular chromosome. A trisomic zygote has three copies of a particular chromosome, as in Down syndrome. Polyploidy. We'll look at this concept again and again, but um, for the first time, we're just going to define it. It's a condition in which an organism has more than two complete sets of chromosomes. So it could be triploidy, which means three sets of chromosomes, tetraploidy, which means four sets of chromosomes. Polyploidy is very common in plants, but not in animals. Polyploids are more normal in, in, in appearance than aneuploids. Breakage of a chromosome can lead to four types of changes in chromosome structure. So these would be alterations of chromosome structure. You could have deletion, where an entire segment is removed from the chromosome. You could have duplication, where an entire segment is repeated. You can have re inversion, where the orientation of a segment is reversed within that chromosome. So that would mean that a crossing over was occurring but then didn't really occur, so, but that segment broke off and then joined back up again, but in the reverse order. Translocation moves one segment from a, one chromosome to the other chromosome. So these were all, would be all alterations in the chromosome structure. And here we have uh, this pictorially represented. Um, you see deletion on the top. Underneath that, you see duplication. Um, then on the top right hand corner you see inversion. This is when things just break uh, but don't join back up in the same uh, order and they flip. And translocation at the very bottom right hand corner. Genomic imprinting. For a few mammalian traits the phenotype depends on which parent pass along those alleles for those traits. Such variation in phenotype is called genomic imprinting. Genomic imprinting involves the silencing of certain genes depending on which parent passes them on. Uh, imprinting, it's just biochemical, it results from methylation, which is addition of a methyl group um, of cysteine nucleotides. Extranuclear genes. So these would be genes that are in the cytoplasm are found in organelles in the cytoplasm. So those organelles would be mitochondria, chloroplasts, and other plant plastids that have small circular DNA molecules. Extranuclear genes are inherited only maternally. And that makes sense because um, the zygote forms from a female uh, gamete, and the male only donates his chromosomal a component, but not any cytoplasmic component. Defects in mitochondrial genes can prevent cells from making enough ATP, which adversely affect the muscular and nervous system. Um, so here we have linkage, and um, we're looking at linked genes. And that is the end and the last slide of this lecture. Goodbye, students.